और Okay, I think Okay, so everybody should be here who's currently logged in. Welcome everyone. We're just going to wait a few minutes and see. We have quite a few more people registered and then we'll get started. Okay, we'll just wait one more minute and see if anyone else joins us and then we'll get started. Thanks for coming. Looking forward to talking to you all about whales and boater safety. Well, I think we'll go ahead and get started. And um, so welcome to our fifth in the series of webinars on uh, boating around whales in Puget Sound, primarily, but also in all of Salish Sea. Uh, we're focusing in on South Puget Sound for this one and it's very timely given that we've had so many orcas hanging around. Um, Stephanie, uh, if you want to go ahead and introduce yourself. Yeah, hi, I'm Stephanie Raymond. I'm uh, Orca Network's volunteer coordinator and program manager. And I also am a sailor myself. Uh, I have a Catalina 25 sailboat and this is my 12th year working as the naturalist and deckhand on the San Juan Clipper. So that's where I'm coming from with the presentation I put together for tonight. And I'm Elisa Lemire Brooks, and I am the Whale Sighting Network Coordinator for Orca Network and um, grown up around boats and on boats, but I do not have a boat. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, but we do, uh, our sightings network does have the pro uh, project of Share the Water and our Whale Safe Vessel project, uh, trying to get the word out about Be Whale Wise laws and guidelines and reach as many people as possible, uh, primarily for the safety and well being of the whales, but also for the humans who are out there who may encounter them. 
Um, so Stephanie will be leading most of the evening and we just wanted to start off with, uh, let's see this one little question here that I can't tell if one of my bars is in the way, but the question is, did you know that there are two types of orcas whose range includes the inland waters of Puget Sound. Many people don't, and with some of the new commercial uh, whale watch licensing laws and regulations, there's much confusion. So we will touch on some of that tonight, uh, but just quickly, uh, we have the endangered Southern residents, uh, fish eating type, and our bigs transients, uh, the marine mammal eating type, who are the ecotype that spend time in southern Puget Sound, which is south of the Tacoma Narrows. Um, the residents in general will go as far south as Tacoma, and um, but usually circumnavigate Vashon or turn back and head back up the main channel. A uh, couple occasions they've gone south in the Narrows over the last several years, but in general, they, they don't go south of Point Defiance. Um, so there we have that. Uh, just a general quick update. Um, the presence of bigs in our inland waters has become a common uh, occurrence and they are staying, uh, they're coming more frequently and staying for longer durations. So this photo on the bottom here is recent. It's from July 23rd and, um, oh, actually I don't know if that one, no, that one's actually early July, I think around the 4th maybe. Uh, and that's the 65As and the T77s, and they're the families that have been keeping to our waters basically since the end of June, pretty consistent presence with a couple of forays back up around the San Juans. And it's been really fascinating because it's not unusual the T65As or the 77s for some family members and youngsters to split off but they're doing it more so now than usual. And so over this last six weeks, they've come and gone and are hanging out in different configurations. So it's been really thrilling and really interesting. And, um, and then our residents up there on top, they, that's a picture from Point Robinson, which is a really lovely place to see them if you ever get a chance. So, um, yeah, those bigs are the ones that have been around primarily. Other uh, groups that have been in recently have been the 46s and the 65Bs and the 64Bs, who are rare visitors to this area. Uh, 36As, 137s, who are another of the uh, most frequently seen here. So things like that. Stephanie's also going to talk about humpbacks, and we've had several of them in here. And I don't, sorry, I don't know what she has in her presentation, but uh, recently we've had a humpback mom calf uh, confirmed in here, and that was pretty exciting just last week. So, all right, I'll start with that. And I think Stephanie wants questions in, uh, you can put them in chat or in the Q&A, and she has paused. So um, feel free to put anything in there, and we'll get those uh, partway through the presentation and then at the end. So, all right, Stephanie. Okay. Thank you, Elisa. Um, so I just want to start too with a really quick poll. It's just two questions, but curious to know where you're coming from tonight as far as whether or not you're a boat owner and where you found our um, information about our webinar. So just a couple minutes for these two quick questions. All right. Okay, thank you for your responses. That's good. It looks like we've got mostly boat owners here and that's great because I definitely am coming at this from the perspective of what it's like to be on the water with the whales. So I'm gonna go ahead and start sharing my screen here. All right. You see that all right, Elisa? Mm -hmm. Great. 
Okay. So um, we're going to talk today about the rules and regulations around whale watching in the Salish Sea, and then also talk a little bit about the different types of whales and some of their more <laughs> South Puget Sound specific behavior. Um, and as Elisa said, please go ahead and type questions into Q&A as we go. We've got a little break for questions in the middle, and then we'll have more time for that toward the end as well. So uh, if you're not familiar with Orca Network, we are dedicated to raising awareness of whales in the Pacific Northwest and the importance of providing them with safe and healthy habitats. Our Share the Water program is one of several that we have, including the Whale Sighting Network, where we encourage people to report any sightings that they have. Uh, our Marine Mammal Stranding Network, we're the designated response organization for Whidbey Island, North Snohomish County, and Skagit County. We have the Langley Whale Center as a brick and mortar facility for people to learn more about whales in Langley on Woodby Island. And then, of course, we have other ed education and advocacy work that we do. And Orca Network really began with the uh, Free Lolita Tokite campaign, uh, trying to bring that last remaining living whale from the southern resident population who was captured for marine parks back to her home waters. So that's a little bit about us. We've got a website that you can find out more. Uh, if you're curious, and let's jump right in. So the laws, rules, and guidelines for being around whales in a boat. There's a lot of layers to these rules and regulations. And starting from sort of the, the most uh, generic to the most specific, there's the rules of the road, uh, which is put out by the International Maritime Organization. These are the conventions that all vessels around the world use generally to uh, ensure safe operations when they're out on the water. NOAA has federal regulations around marine mammals in US waters. If you happen to take your boat up to Canada at any point, Department of Fisheries and Oceans also has specific regulations. And we're not really gonna go into the details of those tonight, but it's important to know that, that there are some. <laughs> And then Washington state law also has some very specific regulations. We're going to spend more of our time on that tonight. So starting out with just sort of the really basic navigation rules that all vessels are expected to follow. Um, rule number five is about having a lookout. Every vessel, and a vessel is a very broad definition, so that means your paddleboard and your kayak count as well shall at all times maintain a proper lookout by sight and bearing, as well as by all available means appropriate to that uh, you're making, you know, you're, you're aware of what's going on around you. You're not going to be surprised by a giant freighter or a giant whale that's coming up next to you because you've been paying attention to what's going on around you. Rule number six is regarding safe speed, that every vessel shall at all times proceed at a safe speed for conditions, so circumstances and conditions. Um, if you see a lot of boats stopped in a particular area, they could be fishing, there could be whales, there could be something else going on. Um, you definitely don't want to go just zipping through there at full speed without knowing, without, you know, taking a moment to assess what's happening in that situation. That's just good basic uh, sea personship. <laughs> now, sometimes to get a 360 degree visibility around your vessel, you might need more than one person if you have a larger boat or if you're traveling at a speed where your bow is raised up out of the water, you might need to have somebody down on the bow where they can keep an eye on you and have good communication between you and your lookout so that if something comes up, you can respond to it quickly. NOAA's guidelines say this, and this is regarding all marine mammals within uh, U.S. waters. So at least 100 yards away from all whales. And in Washington state inland waters, it's 200 yards away. The guideline that also says to limit your time spent observing the whales to 30 minutes or less and not to chase, encircle, or leapfrog whales with any watercraft, any watercraft at all. Um, trapping the whales between the watercraft and the shore is also something you should not do. And particularly since uh, some of the whales that we see here on a regular basis do tend to prefer to travel close to shore, it's important to keep a good distance offshore, make sure that they have room to, to do what they want to do. When you're encountering whales, you should slow down and operate at no wake speed. Put your engine in neutral when the whales approach to pass. 
and avoid approaching whales if calves are present and never put your vessel between a mother and calf. Now, as we mentioned earlier, there are two different kinds of orcas in the Salish Sea, the residents pictured in this, uh, this image and the mammal eating transients or bigs killer whales. And the rules are different for different kinds of orcas. You should always assume if you see an orca that you are looking at the endangered residents until you definitely know otherwise, because the residents are the ones that have the stricter set of rules. And um, you want to be sure that you're, you're giving the benefit of the doubt. It does take a lot of time and experience to learn to identify, especially from an appropriate distance, which whales are which. Just to note that Canada has different laws. So if you're planning a trip to Canada, be sure that you look up and see what those rules are because the rules that we're about to go over for Washington State are not the same as they are on the other side of the border. So as a result of Governor Inslee's uh, ORCA task force, the revised code of Washington had some rules, very specific rules uh, added to it about how boats needed to behave around killer whales in Puget Sound waters. And um, those are being enforced by the Department of Fish and Wildlife, which also means that Department of Fish and Wildlife are who you contact if you are uh, reporting a violation to those rules. So what these new rules say is that it's unlawful for anyone to have their vessel within 300 yards of a Southern resident orca or to position a vessel in the path of a Southern resident orca at 400 yards within the whale. So that means if you're viewing parallel to the travel of the whale, the, the whale's direction of travel. So you run into some whales and not literally, and you, uh, you see them in the distance. So you get 300 yards away from them and follow them at a slow speed. That's a 300 yard distance. If you are trying to get in front of them or behind them, because that's, you know, you have someplace to go beyond where the whales are, um, you want to be sure that you're doing that at 400 yards ahead or 400 yards behind the whales. You don't want to intercept them in any other way. Like even if you, even if that means you have to stop and wait for them to pass by the turn to a bay or something like that, you're going to um, make sure that you're maintaining a 400 yard distance ahead or behind the whales or 300 yards to their side. Also unlawful to be at a speed greater than seven knots at any point within one half nautical miles of southern resident killer whales. And there was another important one there that I skipped over. Um, you don't want to have your transmission engaged if you're within 300 yards of a southern resident killer whale. So maybe you didn't have, you know, you weren't doing perfect watch standing, or maybe the sea state was such that the waves were high and you didn't notice dorsal fins in the distance because that can happen. And suddenly there's whales next to you. Um, if that's the case, assuming it's navigationally safe to do so, you turn off your engine. You just let the whales pass until they're at that 300 yard distance. And of course, we're not feeding the whales either. That's that's an important point that is has now been codified in the law. Now, it's important to notice that there are a lot of exceptions to these rules, especially for military and commercial vessels, and that includes commercial whale watching vessels. Uh, sometimes there's confusion about com commercial whale watching vessels are allowed to be within 200 yards of the bigs killer whales. And that's because the commercial whale watching vessels have people on board who know how to make that identification. Um, if they encounter southern residents under certain circumstances, there's a whole bunch of paperwork involved. So they need to be really sure which whales they're looking at. And um, sometimes if people are, if, if, if recreational boaters see that happening, they're not always they're not always sure why the boats are getting a little bit closer than than it appears that they should. It's because people can tell the difference between the residents and the transients, and that's not always something that your average recreational boater can do. So if you yourself are not 100% confident in your ability to make that identification, then you're staying 300 yards away or 400 yards away front and back. Now, as Elisa said at the beginning of our time together, it's very unusual that the endangered southern residents would come down south of the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. So 
in general, the whales that are that we see down there, you know, those are probably the big killer whales, and that's a 200 yard uh, offset. But you still just want to give them plenty of space, and the viewing differences in terms of how well you can see them between two and 300 yards are really pretty negligible. So always err on the side of caution there. This is just a quick summary um, from our Share of the Water program of how the rules are different for different types of whales. And it does make it a little bit confusing just as the, you know, if you're out there and you see a whale, what should you do? Um, if you stay 300 yards away from any whale that you encounter, you're never going to be breaking the rules. So that's one good way to, to think about it. But in general, 100 yards away from a baleen whale, that's a whale like a gray whale or a humpback, 200 yards away from the big mammal eating killer whales, if you know for sure that's what they are, and 300 to 400 yards away from southern residents um, or, or orcas that you're not sure which kind they are. Also, going slow under seven knots at the first sign of any whale is best practice. Another thing to know about is the whale warning flag. So um, some vessels will fly these, commercial whale watching vessels who are members of Pacific Whale Watch Association will fly these when they're in the presence of whales. And there are other boaters out there who have been getting these so that they can fly them if they're around whales. You're supposed to do it within a within half of a mile or one kilometer of any whales. This is also used on um, the Canadian side of the border should you ever find yourself on a boat up there. Um, if you see one of these, slow down. You might also see them flying from shore. There are places where people will run them up a flagpole on shore if there's whales in the area. So that's another thing to be looking for and, and just be aware that that's out there and that's what that means. You can order your own for your vessel at whaleflag.org. Now, when we talk about what these distance requirements are, it's important to know that accurately estimating the distance over water is extremely difficult. And there has actually been some scientific research about this that shows that most people, when they're asked to estimate distance over water, um, they will assume that an object is closer than it actually is. Um, and it's also something that changes with experience. So. If you are new to boating, um, you should assume that you are not going to have a very accurate est estimate of distance over water if you're just using your eyes. And I've been out there 12 years now. I still couldn't tell you how far something out is. I rely on the rangefinder and um, the radar and the other tools that our captains use to be sure that we're maintaining the proper distance because um, I, I know looking across the water that I can't tell what I'm looking at. In this image, this is an example. So the line on the right here, the yellow line on the right is a distance of one mile. The yellow line on the left, which is just a little bit longer from our perspective here, if you were to measure the distance of those two lines on the image, that's actually a distance of seven miles. So that little tiny space of water between the point and the, the horizon that's a really large distance. And without any sort of reference point, as you're looking out over the water, you know, you don't necessarily have, unless you do have other boats in the area or things like that, that you can use as sort of clues to estimate distance. It's really, really hard to determine because our, our minds just sort of collapse that space. And we assume things are closer than they are or further away than they are. So you can practice estimating distances using radar or GPS if you have an object in the water like a buoy that's stationary. You can see where that is on your radar and you can mark the distance, you know, note the distance on your radar. You can also use Google Maps. So if you don't have a sophisticated setup, maybe you're just using, you know, maybe you're out on a kayak or um, maybe you're on a paddleboard or a little skiff and you have your smartphone with you, assuming you have a cell a cell signal there, you can use the distance measuring tool on Google Maps and also help you to learn about distances. Now, obviously, this isn't something that you can do with a whale that's moving through the water, um, unless you have a rangefinder and you're really good at using it. But you can use this as a way of sort of, you know, you know, measuring something, measuring a distance and saying, well, I think this is 500 yards, and then using 
the Google Maps tool and determining whether or not your, your estimation is accurate. And the more you do that, the better you'll get at getting an accurate assessment of what that distance might be. Another thing you can do is use the five foot rule. So uh, this picture, by the way, is a picture of a vessel that is in violation of the, uh, the current Washington rules. These are Southern resident killer whales off the coast of the west side of San Juan Island. Um, this photo is from the Orca Behavior Institute and was submitted and resulted in a fine for that vessel. A couple things that you can see here is that the vessel is underway because it has a wake and it is definitely too close to the whales. Now, how do we know this? If we've never seen wild orcas before, how do we know that this boat is too close? Well, the five foot rule is that if you look at a male orca's dorsal fin and that whale on the left is the mature male in the group, uh, his dorsal fin's approximately five feet tall, you know, somewhere between four and a half, maybe even six feet. The average human is also about five feet tall. So if we look at the size of that fin and the size of the people on the boat, they're the same, they're about the same size. We know that those two things are too close to each other because if they were far enough away, it wouldn't appear that way. Okay, any questions so far? We've covered a lot in a really short time here. I don't see any in the chat or Q&A, so. Okay, we'll keep going. So that's an overview of the rules and regulations here specifically in Puget Sound. I wanna talk a little bit now about how to report sightings, violations, and entanglements if you should happen to encounter an entangled or injured animal. So Orca Network has our whale sighting network that, um, Post any sightings that are reported. Anyone who sees a whale can report. And I'll give you information about how to do that in just a moment. And those sightings are available on Facebook in real time, or you can also get them as an email digest format to sort of see what's been going on in the last week in the whale world here in Puget Sound. So what this does is it allows researchers to have access to this information so that they can track what's going on with the populations over time. And that's valuable information. And it's really shown us a lot about how things have changed uh, in the, you know, with the behavior of the transient killer whales, for example, um, and the resident killer whales and when they're here and when they're not and where they're going. This is how we know that they, the, res, the resident killer whales don't typically go further south than uh, Vashon Island because we now have this archive of sighting data that supports that. So what you want to report when you see a whale, and the important thing is to make the report, even if you don't have all of this information, include what you have. Because if you just say, I'm here and I saw a whale moving in this direction at this time, and I don't even know what kind of whale it is, that's still a piece of data that we can include and, and put together with other sightings to kind of get a picture of what's happening. Because um, well, multiple species do show up in the same place, um, usually we can kind of figure out if it if it's the same whale that somebody's talking about, even if they didn't get a positive ID. So the time, date, and location of your sighting, the type of whale, if you know what it is, how many animals were present, the direction of travel, if there's an obvious direction of travel, any notable behaviors that you might see, and if you can include photos or videos, um, that's always really great. Sometimes we can identify the individual whales by looking at a photo or video, so that's helpful. And also your contact information, uh, because if we have questions about that information that you've sent, uh, we can follow up with you that way. And here is how to report the sightings. You can go, you can call that 800 number. You can send an email to info at orcanetwork.org. You can post on Orca Network's Facebook or send us a, a direct message on Facebook. And we also on our website now have a sightings report form, which I didn't update there on this slide because uh, our new website has come up since I did this last. But that's another way that you can report and it's a it's a really easy way to do it. Just go to orcanetwork.org and you can find the sightings report form. 
Now, what about boater violations? Uh, with the whales in the South Sound, there's been a lot of concern about vessel behavior around the whales. And people rightly want to report when they see that there's a problem. Um, so when you're reporting a violation, you want to use the same information that you have for the other sightings. What's most important is to include vessel registration numbers. And if you can include photos and videos, that's helpful too. Um, here are also different ways that you can make those violation reports. BeWhaleWise.org has an online violation form in U.S. waters. Um, the NOAA response line is that 800 number. Washington State's number there is for the Department of Fish and Wildlife. So that's more specific to those rules. And in Canadian waters, there's a rule, there's a, a number there too, if you happen to be traveling in Canada. Um, what I will say is that the enforcement resources are limited. And I know there's been a lot of frustration in the South Sound recently because there haven't been enforcement vessels down there when there's been a lot of recreational vessels around the whales. Uh, I know that DFW was down there last weekend, but Honestly, my understanding is that DFW's main focus for on the water enforcement around whales is, is the southern residents because they are so endangered. And that means that they don't have a lot of extra resources to um, address a situation that nobody was expecting where we have a group of transient killer whales that are spending a lot of time in South Puget Sound. That doesn't mean you shouldn't report. It does mean that you should be, you know, you should be considering it's not likely there's going to be a quick response. That photo that I showed earlier uh, with the, the five foot rule with the whales and the boat clearly too close to each other, it took several months for that whole process to play out and for the fine to be issued for that vessel. And it, it just has to do with the enforcement resources that are out there. The more reports, you know, hopefully that's a good argument for um, adding some more resources to DFW. But uh, DFW is also in charge of any poaching or, um, you know, any sort of illegal shellfish harvest, anything that has to do with um, people behaving badly around animals uh, is generally the, the, the purview of Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife's enforcement. And they've got a lot to cover without a lot of resources. So just be aware of that. And, um, you know, consider carefully if you have a, a vessel registration number, that's really what you need in order to get a good response from DFW. Otherwise, there's not a lot they can do. If you have an AIS data, if that boat has their AIS turned on, um, then maybe you can get the vessel name and, and information and, and report that. But if it's just a boat that, you know, you know, it's a, a silver aluminum skiff that's speeding next to the whales, they probably can't follow up on that in any meaningful way. It's helpful still to report it just in, in the term in terms of like the degree of the the problem, but it's not necessarily something that's going to result in uh, you know the the police boat coming out immediately while you're watching and and uh, issuing a ticket to these folks. So just be aware of that. So in light of the information that you've just been given. Would you consider this to be a violation or not? And I guess people will have to uh, maybe make a note in the question and answer section if they feel strongly yes or no. I'm going to take a look and see. OK, I see a yes. Anyone else willing to go out on a limb and say if they think it's a violation or not? Well, I include this picture because it's a little bit ambiguous. I happen to be the person who took this picture, so I knew exactly what was going on. Uh, if I were, and I'm not an enforcement person, so I can only say how I interpret this. But when I look at when I look at this image, what I see is that the boat is not moving. You can see there's no wake, there's no bubbles coming out from their um, their motor. They were stopped in one place as the whales were approaching. So they were stopped well ahead of that 400 yard buffer. 
and they just stayed there and let the whales pass. To my mind, that's probably not a violation, but depending on what enforcement person might watch it, you know, they might, they might feel differently. Um, ideally, when these people saw that the whales were coming toward them, maybe they should have backed away at a very slow pace, as long as the whales were still three to 400 yards away. But if they only noticed the whales within that 300 to 400 yard zone, they were doing the right thing to just stay where they were. So I include this just to kind of, you know, show that there is some ambiguity about what we see and, and what's really happening. If you just saw this picture, yeah, you might think that it is a violation. But if you had watched the scene unfold, you might have perceived it differently. Well, what about this picture? So this, this object down here in the lower right, that is a gray whale surfacing. Is that a violation? <laughs> yeah, heck yeah. A uh, couple things about this picture. So first of all, we can see that that boat is moving really, really quickly. Okay, we've got air under the bow. Uh, we've got a big, a big frothy wake. And the other thing on this picture, all three of the people on board are looking the other direction. So nobody, they, they weren't maintaining proper watch. They weren't maintaining proper speed. These are the first two rules that I talked about. Um, these weren't even related necessarily to whale watching. That was just, again, basic seamanship. That could have been a big log. That could have been, you know, any kind of object that might have done real damage to the boat as well. So just emphasizing that those two things, if you're following those two rules, you're probably not going to have a problem uh, because that, you'll know well in advance of where the whales are. Fortunately, this whale did not get hit, uh, but it was breathtakingly close. And I'm not sure that those boaters ever knew the whale was there. Again, this was a picture that I, I, I saw this scene unfold and, and we were all real nervous until uh, we saw that the whale had gotten by unscathed. So what if you in, encounter an injured or an entangled whale? Uh, of course, you know, everybody wants to help. Everybody wants to, to get involved, but that is really not the proper way to respond to that situation. Um, just a little background, humpback and gray whales are most often the ones that we find entangled along the Pacific coast. And we have had both humpback and gray whales in South Puget Sound this year. Um, so it's not out of the question that you would encounter a whale that had been injured or a whale that might've gotten fouled in a crab pot or something like that. Active fishing gear is frequently the culprit when we're talking about entanglements. An entanglement may not be visible. Um, you might just notice that a whale, for example, a humpback or gray whale, maybe doesn't show its flukes very often, which is something that they would typically do. Maybe it stays on the surface a lot. Maybe it seems sluggish. There may be a visible wound, but a lot of times when something's going on with one of these animals, it may not be visible. And of course, if an animal is dragging around a lot of gear or if the entanglement has happened around its mouth and it can't open its mouth well, it can lead to drowning or starvation for the animal. It's estimated that 35 to 50 percent of the large whales along the Pacific coast show entanglement scars. So this is a pretty significant problem. Again, not necessarily one you're going to encounter in the South Sound, but it's good to be aware of just in case. So if you encounter an animal that's injured or entangled, do not approach the animal. Uh, animals that are in this situation can be really unpredictable. And despite all the YouTube videos out there that show, you know, the humpbacks breaching for joy after the diver has gone in and cut the net off, that's really not what we want people to do. Uh, in, in Puget Sound, in U.S. waters, please don't do that. Please instead report it immediately. And these are the reporting numbers for the United States and Canada. It is not recommended if you have a radio on your boat that you phone it in on um, or that you call it in on channel 16 because people who are monitoring channel 16 might then decide that they want to come check out the situation and that might lead to more stress for the animal. So um, it would be better to call from your cell phone than to get on the marine radio. And then you want to include any info just like any other sighting report plus any additional details about the situation and your own contact information. 
if you can take pictures, especially if you can get any pictures that might be used to identify the animals, like the undersides of their flukes or the view of dorsal fins um, and any visible entanglements, that's good too. Don't worry if they're not perfect pictures. Uh, the folks who are responding to these often want to see a picture, even if it doesn't appear to you that it, it, it shows anything noteworthy, they might be able to interpret something else from it. So be prepared to send those photos in to the folks you're reporting to. Um, this is another situation where, you know, we're not, the whale ambulance isn't going to just show up as soon as you make a call. It, it's going to be a situation where, you know, people have to be alerted and then determine if they can respond and to what degree they're going to respond. So it may not be satisfying in terms of seeing any sort of response. Um, the best thing you can do is let the whale be at that point and, um, you know, hope that there is a response within the near future. Okay. Now we're just going to do a quick overview of the whales here in the Salish Sea and what um, what you might expect to see and where you might expect to see it. Uh, we have our baleen whales and our toothed whales and the baleen whales are typically <laughs> typically larger in, than the killer whales, although the minke whales are sometimes around the same size. They're generally slower than killer whales and porpoises and they may have small or no dorsal fin depending on the species. They frequently travel alone and when they come up to the surface they can have a really low profile in the water so they may not be super obvious or, or easy to spot and um, they're also unpredictable. They can surface anywhere at any time. They don't have really tall showy dorsal fins like the orcas do to kind of give them away from a distance. So all of these things tend to make them more vulnerable to boat strikes, especially if a boat is speeding. And the whale slowly making its way up to the surface, it can't correct at the last minute very easily. So uh, it may not realize that a boat is coming toward it and could get hit. So again, back to that, keeping a good lookout and um, maintaining a appropriate speed for conditions. Our sounders gray whales in particular are vulnerable to ship strikes um, because they have such a low profile and because of where they hang out. Now they don't, the sounders themselves don't typically hang out in South Puget Sound. This is a group of gray whales that return to the area in red on the map here. Um, from late December till May is when they're usually around, but we still have one that's hanging out into uh, late into the summer this year. We have had gray whales go down into South Puget Sound as well, because what's happening here is that on their northbound migration, some of the gray whales realize that they need some food, some fuel to get them all the way up to their Arctic feeding grounds. And they'll come into the inland waters looking for that food. And sometimes they'll find it down to the south, but really the sweet spot for them here is around the south end of Woodby Island. Um, they will be close into near shore because when they're in here, they're often bottom feeding. They're the only whale that does that. Uh, they might be close to shore as the tide is approaching higher high water for the day. So that could be a place that you wouldn't expect to find a whale, especially in the South Sound uh, where there's a lot of shallow water. And because they don't have a dorsal fin, their coloration can blend in with the water really easily. And their, their blow, the breath, can get knocked down by anything more than a light breeze. It, they're really easy to miss if you're not looking for them. So again, they're usually congregating, the sounders are usually congregating near the mouth of the Snohomish River, very close to the Everett Marina. So if you're ever going in or out of the Everett Marina, especially in late winter, early spring, be sure you're keeping your eyes open for grays. This is what they look like when they surface. So you can see how it'd be easy to miss if you weren't really paying attention. Um, when they come up to the surface to breathe, you often will see a heart-shaped blow like in the top photo here. And when they're feeding close to shore, you'll sometimes see the, the pectoral fin, that's the front fin, and one of the tail flukes sticking up over the water because they're rolling over on their side to scoop up a mouthful of mud and go shrimp. It's what they're looking for in particular. So those are things to be looking for. And again, um, particularly last few years, we've had more of a gray whale presence in places outside of that Saratoga Pass possession sound area because there's been an unusual mortality event. There's been something going on with the whale's food supply and uh, we've had more of them needing to find food on their northbound migration. So they've started 
showing up in places that we haven't necessarily expected. The take home messages expect that there could be a gray whale out there because, you know, we're, that's what we're seeing. And uh, they pop up sometimes when at a time and a place that we don't expect. Humpback whales. Uh, their return to the Salish Sea is a really great success story. And it's it we went about 100 years or so without any humpbacks here since uh, the local population was extirpated by commercial whaling in the early 1900s. Um, and then uh, roughly 15 years ago, they started to come back. Um, and now they're starting to use all different parts of Puget Sound. We've had some down in Car Inlet pretty consistently. Uh, and I think they've been down in Case Inlet too. Last summer, 21 new calves were seen brought back by their mothers here in the Salish Sea. This is the largest whale species that we usually see, that we typically expect to see in Puget Sound. And again, vulnerable to boat strikes because they surface unpredictably. Uh, you, if you see one surface in one spot, that doesn't mean it's the next place it's going, it's going to surface in that same trajectory. It might surface in a quarter mile away. They're really hard to predict. And minke whales are our smallest baleen whale that we have here. The red area on the map shows their typical spot, although there have been minkies reported down in Colvos Passage and the Tacoma Narrows within the last couple of months. So again, always expect a whale because they're out there, whether we expect them or not. Uh, these whales are active surface feeders and attracted to bait balls. Um, and that would explain what a minke is doing down in the South Sound. The forage fish down there right now are crazy. It looks like it's raining just with all the little jumping and dimpling of so many fish. Um, so whales that feed on those little fish are going to be attracted to that area if they somehow get the word that 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 food is available there. Minkies can also be very fast and very unpredictable. So again, you might see one surface very close and then it's half a mile away the next time it comes up. So really hard to uh, to predict where they're going to come up. And finally, our killer whales are orcas. The one pictured is a resident, and you can tell that by looking at the dorsal fin. If you see that little finger that's sticking up from the dorsal fin, that's one of the marks that we look for on a resident killer whale that tells us it's a resident. The transient killer whales don't have that kind of marking. They only have a solid white saddle patch behind uh, their dorsal fin. So again, we have the two unique ecotypes here. The residents tend to live in larger extended family pods and are eating fish, primarily salmon. And the bigs or transient orcas that live in, tend to be in smaller family groups, usually a mom and her immediate offspring, although other combinations will occur. And they eat marine mammals. When they're here in the Salish Sea, most often they're eating seals and harbor porpoises. And one of the ways that we tell them apart is by looking at uh, that dorsal fin and saddle patch combination. If you look at each of these images, you can see really distinct differences between the fins and the saddle patches. Uh, some of the fins have notches or marks or a particular shape. Some of them, some of the saddle patches have that, um, what we call an open saddle as in K20 Spock in the center on the top. Uh, L72 Racer has that very distinct racing stripe in her saddle patch. Cappuccino also had a an open saddle. Um, and then Notch, very creative name for that whale who's got a big notch in the back of his dorsal fin. So this is how we know. These are all southern residents. Again, this is how we know the individuals and how we can tell the different ecotypes apart as well. Now our southern resident killer whales are critically endangered. The current population is only 74 animals. And the primary reason for this is prey depletion. And there's many, many reasons why we don't have the salmon now that we had, you know, 100 years ago. Um, that's a whole separate lecture by itself. But suffice to say, because the salmon population has declined so greatly, particularly Chinook salmon, um, these whales are really struggling to survive. They also have to deal then with noise and disturbance. The noises that different vessels create can make it harder for them to, uh, to find the limited number of salmon that are out there for them. And bad boating behavior can also, you know, change their behavior and disrupt their foraging process. 
So we do have some new babies that were born in the last few years, including a couple that were this year. K44 isn't shown here, but uh, that's another new baby in this group. And that's really good news. Hopefully these babies will grow up strong and uh, be able to help the population rebound, but it's still a very, very fragile population. And that's why there are different rules for the different ecotypes, because these whales really do need some extra love and protection to keep the, um, you know, to, so, so they're able to find the fish that are out there and try to rebuild that population. The big killer whales, by contrast, are a thriving population. It's estimated there's around 500 along the West Coast, and the population's increasing at 4% per year. And their behavior has also changed over the years. At the same time that we're seeing the residents, the southern residents, less and less often because the salmon aren't here, we're seeing the bigs orcas more and more often and in larger groups. Um, and they're in the same exact environment in terms of water and pollution and noise as the southern residents. The difference is harbor seals and harbor porpoises are very abundant right now. And the bigs killer whales are coming in to take advantage of that. Okay, so that's a very quick and dirty overview of the rules and regulations, what kind of whales are out there, and I just want to leave you with a few thoughts that the whales are out there, expect them to be there, and make sure that you are um, allowing for that when you're operating your vessel. Some of the whales are slow and low to the water, and that makes them harder to spot, so it does really um, it really is incumbent upon us to keep a good watch at all times. All whale species can appear anywhere in Puget Sound at any time, even whale species that aren't supposed to be here, if you remember our beluga visitor from last fall. Reporting whale sightings will help whales, mariners, and scientists. So it's a good idea if you do see a whale to, uh, to report it and keep a good watch so that when you are out there, you will both get to enjoy seeing the whales and you can also operate your vessel safely around them and uh, report them to folks who want to know what's going on about them. Okay. All right. Well, so anyone else that has any questions, go ahead and put it in either chat or the Q&A. If something comes to mind, uh, there is one question. Is whale safety education required to get a boater's license in Washington? So if you are um, a private recreational boater, you are required to have the Washington State Boater's Education Card. It's not really a license. And there is some information in there about marine mammals. My understanding is it's pretty inadequate. It's only a slide or two. That's a good question. I think there could be there could be definitely more education required. As far as if you are a commercial captain, um, to get a Coast Guard license, you are not required to have anything more than you know maybe a line or two in your training about um, marine mammal operations around marine mammals. You are expected to know the rules, and and if you are a commercial whale watching captain then there are there's a specific license that you need to get from department of fish and wildlife and there's additional training that you take for that good question yeah that was from chelsea thanks chelsea uh lee kayak safety i've seen several social media showing kayaks with orcas going by is that safe so the question is kind of you know what whose safety are we talking about here um the whales themselves are not ever going to, you know, there's, there's no indication that they would deliberately harm anybody in a kayak. However, remember that kayaks were designed to be silent in the water. So uh, they do surprise the whales sometimes. I saw, I, I, I saw once a whale surface right under a kayak. And so, you know, the kayak is here and here comes the dorsal fin. And like at the last minute, the whale realized there was something above and kind of rolled off to the side. Um, it seemed like both the whale and the kayaker were pretty freaked out by that experience, which, you know, makes some sense. So um, I think, I don't think there is an inherent danger to a kayaker or a whale necessarily because, um, you know, they're, 
roughly the same size. But I do think that if you're out in a kayak and you see whales, uh, the best practice is if you're with any other kayakers, raft up so you cast more of a shadow in the water. Maybe knock on the hull of your boat a little bit to make some noise so that the whales know that you're there and you're not just this silent thing that they suddenly encounter when they're coming up to the surface. And uh, another one from Lee, can we report people too close to seals, especially on shore? And can you speak to how to act around seals? So seals, I mean, seals can be an interesting, an interesting thing from a boater's perspective, because again, very unpredictable when they, when they pop up, you know, they can pop up right in front of you and you didn't know it was there. Um, yes, you can report, but that's probably not going to be a high priority in terms of enforcement response. Um, on shore, it becomes a little bit, you know, it, it is a violation of the Marine Mammal Protection Act if people are getting too close to a seal. And um, if, you know, the, the technical definition, I believe, is that if the seal is changing its behavior because somebody is getting too close, then you're too close. Um, the 100 yard guideline is there, but it really has to do with the, the animal's behavior. If you're too close and the animal starts changing behavior, that's that's how you know that you have gotten too close. Um, I don't know a lot more about the specifics of that. That would be a good question for our stranding network coordinator. So if you'd like to follow up with that, um, shoot me an email and I can I can get you in touch with them. Stephanie at orcanetwork.org. And where can we find pics of individuals of transients? Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna defer to if Aaron is still here, because I know I have a copy of Department of Fisheries and Oceans Canada's guidebook that has all of the the numbers. I don't know if there's another place that you can get them. So yeah. I, I would say it depends if you're just wanting photos or if you're wanting the ID catalog. But the uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife, I'm sorry, Department of Fisheries and Oceans Canada has a very extensive catalog. Center for Whale Research has did it for years, but they stopped doing that. Um, they don't do the transient one anymore. They don't. Yeah. But yeah. yeah so, oh, fish sorry. Wildlife, I keep saying fish and wildlife. Go, Aaron, go. Oh, yeah. So I was just saying, is the question just where to get a catalog? Is that? Oh. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, like you said, the um, DFO one is the official catalog for big killer whales, and it is also completely free. Um, so you can get that online. The most recent one was in 2019. Uh, so there have been a significant number of additions since then. I'm not sure how often they come out with new ones, but um, the 2019 one is um, totally free. It's digital and you can just search, you know, 2019. Uh, I think it's like big slash transient killer whale, um, you know, catalog. I think they refer to them as both in that one. Okay, cool. Thank you. And yeah, there have been a lot of new babies since 2019, but um, that's a good start. Let's see. Oh, email for Stephanie again is stephanie at orcanetwork.org. And yes, that clarification, it was for ID purposes, so DFO. Anyone else have any other questions? I don't see any others. Oh, here we go. Uh, you mentioned earlier about Lolita. Has there been any talk on building her a seaside sanctuary so she can one day can reunite with her pod and her mom, Ocean Sun? Lots of talk, but everything's still really up in the air. I'm, I'm afraid there's not a lot more to say than that right now. <laughs> mm -hmm. Great. Okay. I might have had one more comment. Nope. All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining us this evening. And uh, if you have other follow-up questions, feel free to, to drop me an email. I'm happy to, um, if I don't know the answer, I'll find someone who does if the answer is out there. Thanks everyone. Appreciate you coming.